Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Tim Lewins. I'm the Deputy Director of CRASH, the Center for Research in Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities. CRASH is the group that uh, has the great pleasure of putting on all of these uh, Humanitas events, and uh, it's wonderful that you've all turned out here uh, to listen to this conversation between uh, Vim Pybus and Nicholas Cullinan. Uh, and, and Vim Pybus is, of course, a Humanitas visiting professor uh, this year in the history of art. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Tim Knox, the director of the Fitzwilliam, to introduce our conversationalists formally in just a moment. But before I do that, uh, I just want to thank, uh, in particular, the Weidenfeld Hoffman Trust. Uh, as always, for sponsoring these events. Uh, also, uh, J.E. Safra as well, who've particularly had a hand in sponsoring this event, so we're grateful to them as well. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Tim uh, Knox again uh, for allowing us uh, to use the, the wonderful uh, room that we've been allocated here in the Fitzwilliam Museum. It's a, a real pleasure. And also, in case nobody else does it later on, I also want to thank Michelle Machewska, uh, who really um, shoulders the, the burden uh, in, in putting on uh, these events and, and doing the, the organizational work. So thank you very much, uh, Michelle. But I'll hand over now to Tim, who will introduce the speakers more formally. But thank you all. Thank you, Tim. We're all called Tim here. Um, <laughs> welcome to the Fitzwilliam Museum. A very warm welcome. We're sitting in the majestic Founders Gallery, Gallery Number 3, with its array of portraits uh, of Britons, uh, either by British painters or by um, continental painters whilst on their grand tour. Um, as you know, the Fitzwilliam Museum celebrates its uh, bicentenary this year. It's, it's 200 years since the gift of Lord Fitzwilliam, who's actually eyeing us up rather warily, uh, his portrait by Joseph Wright of Derby, surrounded by views of his Irish estate, Mount Merion, outside Dublin. But um, Lord Fitzwilliam would surely be delighted at the thought that his museum has endured for 200 years after he bequeathed his collections and 100,000 pounds in South Sea annuities for its foundation. But he would also, I think, be delighted that thanks to the, um, the, this enlightened patronage, um, we have uh, two uh, other masterpieces, Wim Pybers, who is general director of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and has been responsible for the complete transformation of that extraordinary treasury. And um, we are, we've also invited, and he's also the Humanitas Fellow um, in the History of Art this year, but we've also invited Nicholas Cullinan, who is the relatively new director of the National Portrait Gallery in London, truly, if there ever was one, a repository of the nation's history. And they're going to talk together uh, and I hope uh, there'll be an opportunity at the end for a bit of a question and answer uh, session. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Introducing Wim and Nicholas. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to talk about the museum, and obviously we're going to talk about the Rijksmuseum, and we're going to talk about the Fitzwilliam, and I'm sure we're going to talk about your museum, the National Portrait so. Gallery. Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, so where to start? I think we have an hour, one hour and a half, and then uh, we will touch many topics. And one of the things that is, that is uh, as well as in London as in Amsterdam, you are the National Portrait Gallery, and I'm from the Rijksmuseum, so the State Museum, so to say. So we both have to, let's say, cater a national uh, program of being the museum in your field in portraits, but in my case, history and art of the Netherlands, the country. Mm -hmm. So there is a very much national element in what we do or supposed to do. So, and nationalism, I mean, we are 1885, 19th century museum, like many other museums, so nationalism is always changing. Um, Maybe we talk later on about the Brexit discussion. I mean, what is a nation and how... We're both European museums. And we are Thus both far. European museums, that's correct. <laughs> so how does nationalism is, is an element in what you do as a director? Mm -hmm. And, and what's, is, is it an issue? And if yes, how do you um, use this element of nationalism in, 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 the, daily, uh, in the daily business of, of running the National Portrait Gallery? Shall I start? Yes, please. Um, good, okay. So obviously, um, as Tim was saying, I've been in post for about a year now. Yeah. And before that, I was at the Tate, and then before that, the Met. 
Um, so in a way, this is me coming home. And it's actually a museum I worked at as a student, so I know the museum fairly well. But it, it wasn't really part of my um, trajectory. It, really, I was more focused on modern and contemporary art. And this mm -hmm. um, opportunity came up. And obviously, I know and love the museum. But I have to admit that I was um, intrigued and in a good way somewhat perplexed by the remit thinking about running a museum, which is a, a national gallery, and as you said, what that means, but of course also a national gallery of portraits, which is medium specific. And of course I was thinking about this from New York, so I was outside the country, and even in the time that I'd been away from London, I'd seen a huge amount of change happening across the country in terms of the discussions of... When was that exactly? Um, it was, well, the sort of two years prior to me coming back last year. Yeah. So okay. even in quite a short space of time, I was only at the Met for two years yeah. before I got pulled back, I was quite homesick, I saw a huge amount of change happening from afar. And of course that includes um, discussions over devolution, we had the vote uh, you know, over Scotland while I was away, the beginnings of a discussion over the UK's place in Europe, but more broadly changes to British society in terms of a multicultural society, immigration, all of the things that now are really coming to the fore were already bubbling under. And this makes it sound as if my um, reason for taking this job was very political, and it wasn't. It's because I, I love the museum and I see the potential. But I did think long and hard about the political aspect of such a remit, and in a positive way, mm -hmm. i.e., what could one do with this? But, uh, sorry to interrupt, but go on. what you say is actually speaking from somebody, a Brit, who is abroad. Who well, has not really that. I'm, I was born in America, so I'm, I'm oh, okay, so okay, okay, but, but, yeah. but you're not part of it. I mean, you, you look at it from a distance, and yeah. that, that maybe gives you the opportunity of having a more, let's say, a good position to, to look at here, the UK, what's going on, and, and, and what are they doing? I mean, I mean as, a, as a kind of observer, or... Mm -hmm. Well, go well, on. I, I maybe, so, yes. maybe we come on, on, on that later. But. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, definitely, uh, you know, I was born in the States, I grew up in England, mm -hmm. and I always feel that I'm between those two cultures, which I think is interesting, and especially mm -hmm. interesting in this particular job and context. But really what attracted me beyond just the gallery itself was the potential at this time to hopefully play an active role in some of those discussions in a, in a quietly political way, not that a museum should become actively political necessarily, question, and we'll discuss that. But it felt to me that the, the, essentially the museum was newly relevant at this time. In the, in the context of those discussions, and also as we just touched upon before taking the stage, in a digital era of things like Facebook, Instagram, selfies, so a portrait gallery would seem to me to be even more topical and relevant. This, so those, time, this time is made for you? Well, almost. I mean, yes, I, surely there's, there's huge potential to make even historic things uh, relevant. And, and one example is, I'll, I'm, I'm going to give away a bit of a secret about our forthcoming program, yeah. but when I took on the job... Please do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no one should tweet this, speaking of uh, social media. But when I took on the job, we, we looked at the exhibition program for the years ahead, and, and uh, in 2019, it's the anniversary of Nicholas Hilliard, one of the great... British portrait artist, one of the mm. fantastic you know, artists of the miniature, mm -hmm. and there hasn't been an exhibition for almost 30 years. And so I said, well, what about Hilliard? And I, I was told by the curators, well, no one will come because they're small and people won't queue to look at them. And I said, but don't we all now look at portraits and images <laughs> on small devices? Exactly. So I think you always have to think laterally about how to make the historic newly relevant in this time. That was an easy discussion then. <laughs> <laughs> But what about for you? How does it sit? Um, yeah, I mean, we are the Museum for Art and History. So, and these are uh, components who are very, very different. I mean, um, history mostly is about, is about uh, text and, and facts and, and things. And art is about, well, objects, beautiful objects. And history is not always beautiful objects. It's, it's about objects. Yeah, okay. So, um, thinking about what the Museum of the Netherlands uh, has to do, or what is the mission, is, um, is to, 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 to tell the story about what is the Netherlands. And, and, and indeed you can, if you walk throughout all the galleries, starting in the Middle Ages, because that's where, where our collection starts uh, up to the 20th century, um, you have this awareness of time, sense of beauty, that, that is what the museum is about. Um, but at the same time, we can't do uh, 
everything that is happening in a country like the Netherlands uh, yesterday or last week or last year because it's very difficult to find out in the time we live in what will be history in the future so uh, and that's always the battle we have to 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 fight with curators and not only curators but also with with people from outside the museum what is important to become part of the Rijksmuseum because as soon as you take it in the collection it you have well you're responsible for it and it should be kept for centuries into the future so specifically acquisitions are scrutinized uh, not only acquisitions also exhibitions. also exhibitions and also the point of view from exhibitions i mean history is changing like taste or art or or fashion so let's say the, the colonial past i mean in britain or in holland the, uh, the decolonization of, mm -hmm. of, in our case, the, the Dutch East Indies, so Netherlands, India, Indonesia. Um, uh, yeah, there are. We, we fought the we, we, we fought the war in that in, in in the early 50s, late 40s. So there has been a war, and uh, at the end, Indonesia became independent, like India became independent from the British Empire, etc. So, and there are still. Uh, mm -hmm how to say, eyewitnesses or even people who fought in that, in that, in that war. And they have a different point of view than uh, historians do have. Because nowadays we, we know both sides of the story. Um, and let's say it, it, that in the 50s and the 60s, it was mentioned that this war was, uh, it was not even mentioned a war, it was, a, it was um, mentioned as a, as a corrective engagement by the Dutch so we, we didn't use the word war so but now in the 21st century we use other words like we use other words for uh, yeah for, for for different events mm -hmm. that has been through the ages yeah a, a different point of view we can only judge at this time from this place with our vocabulary that we have now and and it's it's ongoing it's ongoing all the time um, so it's a long story, but anyway, uh, what makes the, the, Dutch, the Dutch National Museum national is that we want to try, and we, I hope that we do, is to tell and visualize the story of the Netherlands to a Dutch audience, mm -hmm. uh, as well as to an international audience. And a local audience, I'm sure. And, and also a local audience. So, uh, and a local audience from kids mm -hmm. up till, well, students and whatever. So it's a very layered story, and uh, it's always the fight to to tell that in a museum visit of let's say one and a half hour mm -hmm. because that is what normally people have and spend their time in the museum so you have to concentrate and, and yeah. so like us you have to work in multiple ways at the same time so you have to work i'm just going to speak over the clock beautiful yeah it's by tompian <laughs> <laughs> i forgive it then <laughs> so you have to work for um a local audience perhaps a, a young audience oh. To, and one of the things that always impressed me about the gallery, my gallery, not to um, sing its praises, but one of the reasons that I really wanted to work there and come back was on one of my visits um, during the interview process, I arrived, I think on a Saturday, rather jet lagged from New York, and I was going through the galleries and, and there were groups of small school children, about five years of old, um, paying rapt attention to the Tudor portraits and fascinated by these stories in a way that when I worked at Tate Modern, we get younger children but they find abstract art, I think, much harder to engage with at that, at that age, which is sort of interesting. So we have to appeal to children. We have to act as a visual history of Britain. But of course, we also have to appeal to an international audience. We have many international visitors. So we have to speak in multiple ways and registers to different audiences at the same time. I'm sure it's the same with you. And it's a challenge as well to get that it, right. It is. What, what intrigues me, uh, in, in Holland, and I think maybe even not on the continent, there is not a national portrait gallery. It, it is typical Britain, and, and you have one in, in the US, of course, but... And Australia. And Australia, okay. You kind of have one uh, in Denmark as well. Not officially, okay. but there's essentially... Okay, I didn't Friedrich know that, but, but what intrigued me is what makes an object, uh, yes or no, uh, fit in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery. I mean, you do acquisitions. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, commissions we, too, which is quite And unique. you commission as well to British artists, or...? N well, we commission portraits of they don't have to be British citizens, but it's people that have contributed to British life in some way. Yeah. And the artist can be 
anyone. It, it could be an international artist, so there's potential there. So the portrait by, by Marlene Dumas, the Dutch painter, exactly. of Amy Winehouse, yep. the British singer. Is it, was it a commission or...? No, that was a, that was a purchase. So, that was, so the, we, one of our most recent acquisitions, well, not that recent now, but one of the highlights of our contemporary collection mm -hmm. is a portrait of Amy Winehouse, I'm sure you all know of, which was painted in 2011, the year she died. I think just, just posthumously, just after her death, it was painted in response to her death by um, Marlene Dumas, who's a South African painter of some note and esteem. And what was interesting about that portrait for us is that it was posthumous. And one of the criteria of our collection when we commission or when we acquire is that it should be painted from the life, to use the um, antiquated phrase. So we broke with tradition there. But I think, I mean, it, it obviously it predates me being at the gallery, but I think mm -hmm. the, the thinking was on behalf of the curators and the trustees that in a way um, it fits within Marlene Dumas' practice because although she paints recognisable sitters and subjects, they're always mediated through photography and often through the media itself. So there are images found on the internet or scavenged through newspapers. And of course, in a way, that chimes rather poignantly with Amy Winehouse's own life, which was so devoured and ultimately destroyed mm -hmm. by the media. So that was the thinking, I think, behind that. But <clears throat> living in times, uh, I mean, 2016, mm -hmm. you have this whole phenomenon of stardom and, and well, royalty, okay, that, that has always been yeah, there, but star stardom, <laughs> pop stars, football players, David Beckham, mm -hmm. uh, the Spice Girls, I mean, you have Amy Winehouse, but wh where do you start and where do you stop? That's a very good question, it's a question I've been asking myself a lot, and I have to say, um, I'm just coming to this on the back of, we just discussed mm -hmm. these um, photographs of the Duchess of Cambridge, who's our patron, mm -hmm. which have received a huge amount of um, attention around the world, but celebrity per se doesn't really interest me. And one thing I'm keen to do with the gallery is to make sure that we're strong in each of the fields that we represent, whether it's each of the periods from the Tudors to now, different mediums, um, but also thinking about different types of exhibitions, whether they're monographic, thematic, historical, medium specific, and not focusing exclusively or too much on the more contemporary photographic, celebrity driven aspect, which I suppose is a, is a temptation because with it comes huge attention and footfall. And I think we're all, well I am, maybe you're not, beholden to visitor numbers. Are you? Actually that's one question I had. Uh, Do you have to always worry about the box office? Uh, worried in, in two ways. Uh, too little, yeah. too many. Oh really? I only have to worry about too little I think. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, too many that, that well, that's another, that's another discussion. Mm. Maybe, maybe we, 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 we'll come back. We, we'll yeah, we come back on yeah. that. So, but, but first, I want to, to have more, a bit more on, about this national. I mean, we also have Marlene Dumas, mm -hmm. which indeed is a South African uh, painter also, yeah. who is living and working uh, most of the time in Amsterdam. So, yeah. indeed, what is, what is Dutch, what mm -hmm. is national nowadays? I mean, these borders are, are fluid are blurred indeed and, and, and changing all the time. So, uh, I mean, Rubens is, is Flemish, though he worked mm -hmm. all, all over Europe. Anyway. And Van Dyck is British, according uh, to our yeah, and, and Picasso <laughs> is Spanish. <laughs> Don't say that to a Frenchman. So, um, yeah, that, that's right. So th this whole theme of nationalism in art is, is something that is very, well, disputable. Mm. Um, but, but, but still, so you have Amy Winehouse, but coming back on this, I mean, who is deciding uh, in, in this time? I mean, there are so many portraits around. On mm -hmm. your Twitter site, it says the National Gallery of the Nation National Portrait Gallery has the largest collection in the world about faces and personalities. Mm -hmm. So what, 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 what actually is the difference between the two? Oh, I suppose how much... Is that a, is that a, port is, is that a face or a personality? Um, well, maybe it's based on how attractive the sitter is, so I'd say that's a personality, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that's one distinction. Yeah. No, well, obviously, we, you have to represent both, and yeah. a face is not enough. You want to, yeah. in a good portrait, whatever the medium is, yeah. you want to convey a sense of the character, the inner life yeah. of the sitter, so you, that's perhaps where we use both terms together. Um, in t people are fascinated by the commissioning process and, and how and we choose. Is there a committee or...? or Right, so ultimately it's the trustees that decide. Well, there's many, many, um, not to say quirks, but um, particularities of the gallery. And, and over time, some of those have been reassessed. So for example, until the 1960s, under the directorship of Roy Strong, mm -hmm. who really moved the gallery forward in many ways, um, a sitter had to have been dead for 10 years before they could enter the collection. Yeah. 
unless you were the reigning monarch or their consort. And so Roy Strong and the trustees overturned that, which opened up the chance to commission portraits of living sitters. Um, like you do. Like we do now, exactly. Yeah. Except in the case of Indian Winehouse, so we've gone back in time. Yeah. Um, in terms of the actual commissioning, in, in, okay, so for acquisitions, that's more straightforward. Basically, it's decided by our curators, as with any museum. There's a curatorial discussion about which portrait we should acquire. It's usually based on availability as things come up, such as the Van Dyke two years ago. Yep. If you decide it's of incredible merit and worth for your collection, you do everything you can to pursue it, and you fundraise and you make an appeal. Um, equally, just to say, we also acquire a huge amount of photographs, which are often not very expensive. Sometimes they're cigarette but cards. You, you don't do family albums? We do sometimes, yeah. I mean, we, the, our photography collection is 250,000. It's, a, it's the biggest part of the collection, and that encompasses... But nowadays, with all these selfies around, I mean... Well, we, we don't acquire selfies yet, but give us time. But we'll how, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, that's one of the most, <laughs> maybe, popular forms of, of photography nowadays, mm -hmm. and it has to do with your field, yeah. with the field you're collecting in. So how do you... You don't have a single selfie yet. Not yet. I'm just thinking, no, we don't. Not to say that we wouldn't, but I wouldn't want to jump on that bandwagon. And people have asked me, one of the, the big questions is, when are you going to do the first exhibition of selfies, which is not obvious. Lots of self-portraits. Oh, we've got lots of self-portraits, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you're, you're talking, you're, I, I presume here by selfies, we're well, being the, rigorous. Yeah, this one. We're yeah. talking about, exactly. Yeah, I, we talk about this yeah. one. And there's also this precursor. So for example, Edvard Munch, I, I did an exhibition at Tate about four years ago, yeah. made essentially selfies using a, a camera held at arm's length. Already at the time? In the 1920s. I see, okay. Um, so there's the selfies go back away. Okay, but anyway, okay, the modern okay. phenomenon of selfies, which is with a handheld camera phone, yeah, yeah. we haven't acquired yet, not to say that we wouldn't. I think there's actually some on display at Tate Modern now in the exhibition performing for the camera, which I haven't seen yet. I have to go and see okay. it. Okay. But anyway, um, people have also asked me, when are you going to do an exhibition of selfies? And that could perhaps happen. We, we, we definitely have conversations with people like Instagram or yeah. Tinder, social media yeah, sites, yeah. to think about ways that there might be some natural it's overlap. Representing the, 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 the face, uh, yeah. uh, representing the image of somebody's face, or is that basically too... Yeah, it's about that, but we do that with every portrait in the collection, whether, as, as Tim was saying, whether it's a, a photograph or uh, a painting or an etching. And so I don't really want to just jump on that bandwagon for the sake of being topical. Mm -hmm. And what, what interests me more, as I was saying before, is making links. So for example, reframing something like Hilliard in the way that we now look at small glowing images, which are about mm -hmm. this big. And I think in a way then that makes that exhibition more legible to modern viewers. So that, uh, that I think is more interesting than doing the obvious selfie project. So doing that, you make, it, you make somebody from the past relevant for today's audiences. Yeah. You, you, you really you understand that people look indeed at, at small, yeah. small screens. And also not, not that some of those figures have to be made relevant, because I find that phrase slightly patronizing. When people say you have to stage Shakespeare in modern clothes, I always think, well, yeah. you can or you, you cannot. You can decide. It doesn't really matter. I mean, the works and the words speak for themselves. But it's one way, I think, of just um, of getting a message across, which is important to a, a different audience and to a wide audience. And I don't want to just preach to the converted. I think it's important to bring artists to a new audience in terms of generations or people that haven't encountered their work before. So you always want to reach to the widest possible audience. There's another thing that uh, we, we, we discussed it very shortly coming on stage, is that I was wondering, I mean, in, in, in Britain you have Francis Bacon, you have Lucian Freud, I mean, two of the most eminent painters, artists are, well, portray... Or the human figure. Yeah. Or the human figure, indeed. but. Uh, yeah, what is a portrait and, and, and human figure? I mean, wh where does a portrait start? Somebody in a landscape is, is not... It's a, a good question. We, we have this debate often. Well, a portrait is usually a, a named sitter that you can identify, to put it in the most basic terms, okay. rather than a figure study. I mean, for example, we're doing an exhibition of Picasso this autumn, and Lizzie Cowling, the curator, has been very assiduous in only including portraits, and portraits where there's a named sitter who you can identify, even if there's a degree of abstraction, as there is with some of his sitters. So, for example, Olga, who was his second wife, I think. He begins, second, I think, yeah, yeah I'm, keeping, second. yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm keeping score. <laughs> um, he begins by painting her around 1918, when he's yeah. in his so-called neoclassical phase, yeah. in a way which is almost reminiscent of Ang, where she's very recognizable. And then, 
later in the 20s as he moves to his surrealist phase, there's a degree of abstraction that enters and caricature, which is something else we look at in the exhibition, but you can still recognize her even though the, the features are distilled. Um, so just going back to the question about you know, a figure study versus a portrait, I think that's something you always have to think very carefully about. I mean, there's Picasso's, which are of a person. For example, there's the Weeping Woman in the Tate's collection, which you all probably know, which is, was painted around 1937, around the same time as Guernica, and it's presumed to represent Dora Maar. Yeah, we, we all think. And exactly, yeah, yeah. and we had a long discussion about that painting because it's such a masterpiece, it's so wonderful, it would have been great to include, but ultimately, it's probably not really a portrait of Dora Maar, it's an archetype. She becomes a cipher and she becomes, in a way, a symbol of the suffering of humanity at that point. So really, it's not the portrait of her, it's something bigger and more inclusive. So we decided in that case so not you to. you don't do what in Dutch painting is called tronies, faces. Well, and and Marlene de Maud paints those too. Um, yeah. No, not currently, but that's another okay. interesting phenomenon which we might think about. Okay. But an another point is, I mean, coming to Britain and thinking about the National Portrait Gallery, about Lucian Freud, about Bacon, uh, this whole phenomenon of, of stardom and, 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 and the, well, the, 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 the press, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very typical British thing. So what do the British have with portraits? Uh, with, with, is there a, a kind of, I mean, in, in Holland you have painters and they make mm -hmm. landscape, they make dit, and, they, and we, 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 all, we also do portraits, I mean, the Nightwatch, obviously is a portrait. You have is great a, portraits, some of which I want to borrow in the future, by we the way. We have beautiful portraits and, and, <laughs> and you're free to lend what you like, <laughs> except that one. But, <laughs> the, but, the, um, but thinking of Britain, I mean, mm -hmm. portraits, are, I mean, Gainsborough, that's, I mean, you really have a strong tradition in, in, in portrait painting. I suppose I, I never thought of it in those terms, but I think it is true. Well, for example, when, when the National Portrait Gallery was founded in 1856, by, amongst others, Thomas Carlyle, the famous um, essayist, he said that he thought one portrait, one painted portrait, was worth half a dozen written biographies. So straight away you have this kind of paragony between the, the visual image and the written word, which is quite interesting. But uh, yeah, I don't know why in Britain it's the first portrait. I don't have the answer, but it's, uh, it's just and something. of horses and dogs as well. Yeah, which is just as important. Thing. And of houses, you know. <laughs> Lord Fitzwilliam has portrait done of his park. It's obsession, yeah. It's obsession, mm, yeah. just like mm. that. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> Do, but you think it's a uniquely British phenomenon? I, I, Again, I, I, I was wondering, I mean, um, coming from the outside, from, yeah. the, from the other side of the, of, of the channel, yeah, Europe. <laughs> 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 the other part of Europe. Um, yeah, I, I think there is a strong tradition in, in, in portraiture mm. in, in Britain, and, and there must be some fascination. I don't know what it is, but maybe somebody in the audience might have a clue for that. But, yeah, that's uh, another thing that we'll be discussing in, is, is having this time where we live in, this whole Facebook and, and, and this, this obsession, not only in Britain, but worldwide in, in well, it, it is called Facebook, I mean, Facebook. So you really, and selfie, and all this, all the time we live in, I mean, the National Portrait Gallery, um, I don't know how long already, but since 15, 20 years maybe, or maybe shorter, it is really a hot, ticket to go to. It, it's, yeah. it's a very modern uh, museum where you feel the, the, the time you live in, which is in a way strange, as you say, mm. Tudor portraits, and, and not only for a British audience, I mean an international audience. Well, people are fascinated by faces yeah. or personalities, to go back to that. But, but that, that, that there was somewhere, there was a tip, tipping point that, mm. that the National Portrait Gallery was one of the must-see ex exhibition spaces in London. Yeah. Good. It should be. Yeah, well, yeah, okay, but, but, but somewhere there was this tipping point. Don't sound point. so surprised. <laughs> no, I, I try, as a, as a museum professional, I try mm -hmm. to analyze. I, it has not always been the case. Yeah. Somewhere was this, I mean, when Tate Modern uh, opened, when was that, 2000? 2000. In 2000, yeah, okay, so the year of 2000. It was really uh, all the things moving. You had a young, young British artist, you had Freeze, you had, yeah. you had the Tate Modern, and I think in retrospect, in that, in that whole movement, there was also suddenly this national port, this old institution uh, that, that came up as, as, as a hip place where you could, yeah. could, could see very contemporary exhibitions. But that's uh, been growing for a long time, and I want to also okay. then turn the tables and ask you some questions, but yeah. the, Tate Modern, in a way, was the apotheosis of something that, as you said, that had been happening for at least a decade before, which was 
um, through, for example, Charles Saatchi's exhibitions at Boundary Road, through the YBA phenomenon where yeah. those figures such as Tracy M and Damien Hirst percolated into the mass media. Before, before the 90s, or say the late 80s, the appetite for contemporary art in the UK compared to somewhere like the States or possibly Europe, continental Europe, I think was much less. Yeah. And even the appetite for museum going, we've seen it rise, you know, muse museum attendance in all of the big London museums and in museums in Cambridge um, increases year by year, I'm sure. Yeah. You find the same thing. And so I think as a culture, as a country, our sort of visual literacy is improving consistently, which is very heartening. But it's 50 years, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's a recent phenomenon. So actually, in spite of the things you're saying about our, our interest in portraiture, I would say that for me, the UK is a culture more of literature, perhaps, than painting, yeah. if you want to really put it into sort of crude terms. And you have Shakespeare, we have Rembrandt, as we say. Yes, I mean, exactly. I mean, the Dutch are not world known for their, for their writers yeah. or philosophers. I mean, yeah. but painters, yeah, hey, Mondrian, Vermeer, Rembrandt, we have a few. So but have you noticed similar shifts in, in the appetite for museum going and galleries um, and contemporary art as well, or historic? Well, contemporary art always has been uh, well attended in the mm -hmm. Netherlands. Um, maybe even more than in Britain. I mean, before, before uh, 2000. And museum attendance always has been very good in the Netherlands because we, yeah, we have quite a few uh, homegrown masters. Uh, I mentioned a few, Van Gogh, not, mm -hmm. not to forget. So, um, yeah, it's much more in the DNA of, of Dutch culture to go to museums and to enjoy uh, well, Van Gogh, Mondrian, Rembrandt, Vermeer, it's mm -hmm. all around. So. Um, yeah. And it's not focused on a particular period, because now no. one phenomenon that we have in this country is that, I mean, contemporary art gets the bulk of the attention, and yep. the attendance at Tate Modern has risen and risen and risen, and historic exhibitions at, say, the National Portrait Gallery, the National Gallery, the Royal Academy, often don't do as well. Not always. Rembrandt did very well. Mm -hmm. You'll be glad to hear. But it's often a struggle to get um, a large audience to a, an historic exhibition, which it's, I find... I think the, the Royal Academy, for instance, is doing very, very well with... with old masters or impressionists or whatever? Mm, not, not, well, the, 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 the recent exhibition, The Art of the Garden, which was sort of Monet et yeah. al, did very well because yeah. there's huge appeal. But uh, there was the Giorgione exhibition that's on now. I think that's doing, it's yeah. doing relatively well, but the, the projections are quite modest. Okay. And certainly, you know, the, the, the figures that really get the crowds are the great modern figures. So, you know, Matisse, Picasso. And then sometimes contemporary art can also reach a, a broad audience if it catches the right zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that's getting most of the attention and focus. And that, again, is a new phenomenon, that the, the audience for some historic exhibitions are actually dwindling. And so one thing that I really want to do is try to build that back up, because I think it's a shame that younger generations are not discovering those artists. But you don't have that issue. No, I think both uh, are doing very well in, the, in Holland or the continent. I mean, contemporary art, yes, but I think contemporary art really is, is doing much better, mm -hmm. especially in London. I don't know in, in Cambridge or, or other parts of the country, but contemporary art in, in London is doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there is a huge audience anyway for, for any kind of, 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 mm -hmm. of art. I mean, museum figures, they go up worldwide. Um, the success of the Rijksmuseum. I mean, we, we used to have a, a, about 1.2, 1.3 million visitors, and after reopening, we, we we doubled to over 2 million, 2.5. And that's remained consistent. And and it didn't collapse after a year. Normally, you have uh, you open. Let we, we reopened in 2013, and then we had the first year two point something visitors, and everybody said, okay, after one year, it will stabilize or it will drop a bit and then it will stabilize of, let's say, 1.8 or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we, it's now 2016, we, we're still growing. It's, it's incredible. And it's, uh, so that's one question I wanted to ask you as well. Having um, survived a triumphant refurbishment, is that the right term for the Rijksmuseum? I mean, it wasn't an expansion as Somebody such. called it a transformation. Transformation, yeah. that's yeah. a good word. Yeah. And which was a huge success. And yeah. F really fantastic, you know, I went there, as we were saying, two or three years ago to see it. So I think everyone universally acclaimed it. But what are your views on this consistent drive to expand museums, build new wings, refurbish? It seems that no museum can remain still now. Everything has to be constantly renewed. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or it's, what's it symptomatic um, of? 
a few, a few thoughts about this. I, I think the really strong, big museums, um, I mean, the Rijks, in, let me first say this. I think the Rijksmuseum was one of the last national museums that really did a big, complete makeover, transformation, refurbishment. It started all with the Louvre, with the pyramids, mm -hmm. uh, then the National Gallery here in London, the British Museum did it, uh, um, Metropolitan did some wings, the, 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 the MoMA did... They're always did, doing wings. Yeah, they're always <laughs> doing wings. Um, it's like the Firth of Fourth Bridge. Uh, so, so, yeah. so, so Tate, uh, Tate split up from mm -hmm. Tate Britain, Tate Modern. Uh, Berlin was building in the 80s. Um, so all the, all, the, all the countries all over the globe were, were refurbishing and, and remaking new museums. Yeah. And all these museums in all these countries, they started, originated somewhere in the 19th century, like the Rex Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, so sooner or later, it's your turn to, to make a big makeover. And, and of course you have to rehang the collection, you have to refurbish the Yeah, it's galleries. more than rehang. It's, it's yeah. climate, it's, it's that yes. uh, you have more and more visitors, so you need more toilets, you need more tickets offices, you need uh, a bigger place, you so need more... Anabolic. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. you, you need to grow, whether you like it or not. So, um, and the Rijks Museum indeed was in 2013 the last to mm -hmm. be in that whole row of, of big national museums. Uh, however, our, the, 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 the difference between all the other museums and the Rijksmuseum is that we did it completely. The whole building was emptied and there was nothing in the whole building whatsoever. So we were we, closed for how we many were, years? And the other thing is that we were, we, we were closed for 10 years, yeah. saying that we only had the south, a smaller part of the building that was somewhere open and we had only about 400 masterworks on show. So the Night Watch and so on always have been on show, but, but still, the main building was off the radar for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So after that, we reopened and uh, we, we had the chance to rehang and to refurbish the complete museum. Mm -hmm. uh, the furniture, the tax labels, the uniforms of the people, the ticketing, the house, the, the, the graphics, the whole thing, the walls, the whole, the lighting, everything. So that has the great advantage of not having a new wing or a new gallery or a new this or that. No, we were closed for 10 years and we could do it all over again. So the tabula rasa. It was yeah, tabula rasa is, yeah. is the right word. And uh, that, in my mind, is, has been the first time ever that a museum at the scale of the Rijksmuseum, a big national museum, had the chance to start from tabula rasa again and to reinstall as if it were a complete new museum. Of course, the collection was there, including all the masterworks and the iconic Vermeers, etc. They were there, yeah. they were in storage. Uh, so we could have this new museum yeah. uh, and we could start all over again. And what we did, and I think that's part of the success of the Rijksmuseum, is that we broke with the old, or let's say traditional way of hanging and, and installing. Uh, that all the curatorial departments, glass, armory, uh, jewelry, um, fashion, paintings, decorative art, who used to be separated all over in, in separated galleries, we decided to mix it and to have in a chronological display every floor a century. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically what it's about. So Middle Ages, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20th century. So you really can walk through the galleries and have this, what we call, this sense of time, uh, sense of beauty, awareness of time element. So in our galleries, you see furniture, you see costumes, you see glass, you see silver, you see paintings, all at a glance. With no distinction between no, medium no. or exactly. craft. Exactly. Or uh, well, it's a bit as in, the, as in the Fitzwilliam. I mean, I love to see a museum like this where, where you can see a clock, you can see decorative art, and you can see paintings in all in a, in a great display of, mm -hmm. of things that, well, not in this, or in this case, time. of the time. I yeah. mean, here is a bit, bit more mixed up. But what we did in, in Amsterdam is to, to choose and to curate only the best of the best uh, items that belong to a certain period. And, and so it, it gives you really a sense of middle age Holland in a, in a kind of international context. So when you have that tabula rasa, when you yeah. think about what this museum could be and how you could hang it and yeah. what narrative you could tell, yeah. was there a temptation to 
break with chronology? And the second question is, what do you think of museums that don't adopt a chronological approach, such as Tate Modern, say, and we're obviously waiting yeah. for that expansion and reopening next month? Yeah, it's, uh, that's a good question and an intriguing question. It's a mean question. Time. No, it's not a mean <laughs> question. No, 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 no. Funny enough, I was, I was, uh, who of you have been to my talk on Friday? Quite a few. Okay, so what I, what I, uh, what I said there is that I have been looking around, mm -hmm. see many public buildings, including museums, and I also was looking at Tate Modern because I found Tate Modern, for some reason, a very good example of what a new museum for 21st century would bring. Mm -hmm. um, and the things I liked very much, I liked very much on Tate Modern, but one of the things in the galleries I liked very much is that the very, uh, how to say, not strict art historical way of hanging and choosing works, but a kind of informal, mm. Um, uh, criteria of, of mixing or bringing things together. So it's not only about choosing certain works of art, but it's also about connecting the dots. So that next to that. So to formally, that. through yeah. drawing visual comparisons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, visual comparisons, yeah. let's say uh, color or, or uh, city life or mm. the human gaze or whatever. I yeah. mean, ju just things that could. That, that you could relate to as a visitor, not even as a specialist. So there were no rooms of surrealism or Dadaism or, mm -hmm. or constructivism or any other ism that is so well labeled by, by, by art, historical, uh, art historians in a indeed cr a chronological order. Mm -hmm. If you go to a museum, uh, yeah, you don't even know what Dadaism means, whatever. You, 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 you're, uh, yeah, you're innocent in a way. And, and mm -hmm. Um, yeah, what Tay did very well is to to teach to teach you learning and looking at, at pieces and, and not not them. bothering not bothering you with with Dadaism or surrealism yeah. or whatever. Well, that works for them because of yeah. it being a modern and contemporary museum that spans around a hundred years. And also, of course, it, it for them it's very clever. And it was covering something in the collection. Exactly, you may say it. Of yeah. course, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it works. For, and the other thing, I mean, to give them full credit of one of the many extraordinary things that Tate Modern has achieved is also a much more global account of modern and contemporary art, yeah. and that's what they've been working on over many, many years now through the collection. I think we'll see it in the, the rehang of the new wing or building, or whatever it's called, which is a, a much more inclusive, truly international account of what 20th century art looks like, which I think is exciting. But what you say, and, but very fast, the, there is a weakness in the collection of Tate. Yeah. I mean, some people say the collection of the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam is stronger. I mean, they have more icons and they have, yeah. they have very, very strong chapters of modern art. Okay, Tate has a bit of that, a bit of that, and they have a lot, but they do not have very strong iconic works from all these periods. Yeah. So, um, by, by covering that weakness, uh, by rehanging uh, Tate Modern in a kind of visual, poetic way of hanging, you don't miss that. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a very clever way of, of, of dealing with your collection, mm -hmm. which is a good collection and a strong collection. But sometimes you do but miss. But it's not encyclopedia. It, it's yeah. not a complete encyclopedia uh, it's collection. It's very difficult to teach from. Yes, that's, that was just... I mean, yeah, the yeah, thematic yeah. Exactly. play, I mean, Ex teaching... Ex you can't teach cubism. I mean, it would be useless in a university museum, I suspect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, apart from anything else, you never know where anything is. Yeah, it's everything exactly. around yeah. all the time. Exactly. It might be in Liverpool or St. Yeah. Ives as yeah. well, which... Yeah. 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 But that's not an approach that would work for the Rijks Museum, or indeed the National Portrait Gallery. I think we're pretty wedded to technology. Uh, no, though we, 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 we as well, we miss a lot. I mean, yeah. being the historic, the Museum for History in the Netherlands, there has been a discussion of a separate museum of mm -hmm. the history of the Netherlands but it was cancelled the other day. But anyway, we, m we do miss a lot of things in our museum, I mean, uh, uh, for historians. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Let, let's say um, that women may vote, for instance. Yeah, okay, it's a very important step in, in early 20th century. The vote, everybody may vote at a, cer at a certain point. Okay, perfect. But how do you tell that story in a museum without having the objects, and you can have objects, but then you, you don't want to have all kind of showcases behind glass, all kind of paperwork. It's, it's, it, would be, it would make it a very dull museum. So 
But you're yeah, of, or child labor or something. I mean, th that is very difficult to explain that in an attractive way. But do you think of yourself in, as an historical museum? Because I, I think of the Rijksmuseum as, as a museum of art first and foremost, whereas the National Portrait Gallery, oh, we are history yeah. first. We're always yeah, sitter yeah. first, art is second. It's a different right, criteria. Right, but our mission is history and art at the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, And these are different departments uh, still. So, um, yeah, that, 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 is, that is difficult because you have very beautiful objects, and we call that art, and you have very ugly objects who might have played a very, very important role in Dutch history. Yeah. But they, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a glass of William of Orange. Yeah, okay, it's a normal glass, but it's a very important glass because mm -hmm. this is the last glass that he used in the whatever it is. So uh, you need a story to explain uh, the importance of an, of an historical object mm -hmm. and, and for an art object you well you, you see that this it is beautiful it or whatever. Makes its own case, yeah. But at the same time I always say the night watch it is art and history at the same time. I mean you see the people in power, you see the whole Dutch it's a document. Demo democratic um, uh, way, the way we run a country. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what we call the polder model. Uh, everybody is, is equal mm -hmm. to a certain extent. So Indeed, the, the night watch is art and history coming together. So, there's just one more, as you were talking, there's one more question I want to ask you, which is very specific to Amsterdam. And you were saying that obviously the Rijksmuseum was closed for 10 years, which must have been very difficult for the museum, yeah. and I imagine very difficult for the, the, the population of Amsterdam. Yeah. And it was happening at the same time that also the Stedelijk Museum, which is next door, yeah. Yeah. the great museum of yeah. um, modern and contemporary, or possibly greater than Tate Modern, question mark, um, was also <laughs> closed. <laughs> That's to discuss in the q and I didn't say that. No, no, I'm just, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. <laughs> and that was also closed for, for a number of years too. Yeah. And the Van Gogh Museum was also closed for some of that time, I think, as well. After. The, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So there was yeah. a moment. And, I, I, and the Boymans was closed, I think, as well, in Rotterdam. You had no museum. But I remember <laughs> at, at, the, at the time, so I, I was working at Tate Modern, and I was working on the Malevich exhibition. That was part of the success of Tate Modern, so everybody had to <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I remember coming to Amsterdam to work with the Stedelijk on the yeah. Malevich exhibition yeah. and um, the staff there saying this profound sense of loss that the yeah. people of Amsterdam had, that their, muse their great museums had temporarily gone and for longer than they realised. Yeah. And I think yeah. in London and across the UK and other cities and countries, sometimes we risk taking museums for granted. And I wanted to ask in that very particular case, and now of course happily you've reopened in a triumphant way, yeah. but what was the sense of absence and loss and then how was that made good when you reopened? Well, it's a rather For sad... For most people, I mean, yeah. what was the sense well, of... Well, it's, it's a rather sad story. I, I mean, uh, we were closed, yes, yeah. but the 400 masterworks, including the night was, they always have been on show, so... Mm -hmm. But still, um, and well, and in this small building, we still attracted a million visitors a year. Yeah. So as a I came, I was one of them. Yeah, so as a business model, it was quite mm -hmm. successful. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the state look at a certain point was completely off the radar. Yeah. So uh, what I do now when asked uh, how to rebuild a museum and what are the do's and don'ts, my first advice is never close down completely and, and be being off the radar. I mean. J just hire a small building opposite the street and, and do the two or the five masterworks or change that every month or whatever, but mm -hmm. stay, uh, keep, a, uh, keep a building uh, alive, accessible for an audience, whatever it is, because if you're completely off the radar, like the Stedelijk did, uh, something very bad will happen. You, you are not, you're not existing. I mean, being a beautiful collection, but a collection in storage is, 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 is not existing. It's, it's like a book in, in, a, in a shelf. It's not there. It's, well, it is I, I remember colleagues at the Stedelijk saying there was already at that point, this is now, what, four or five years ago, a generation of, of um, young people and yeah. artists that had yeah. no museums exactly. to exactly. go to a reference. Yeah. Oh, you're right. I, I'm, I'm, it has been a scandalous time for long and took too so long. I wasn't trying to embarrass you. I was just curious what that feels like and what that yeah, means. Yeah, but it has to do... I mean, we're a democracy, and that means that everybody has has an important uh, thing to say and we listen to everybody and uh, the time we live in it, it, it's I mean it's good that everybody has an opinion and that uh, that we listen to everybody and that uh, everybody can say this and that but I think there are so many regulations to be aware of European regulations local regulations I mean we had I needed uh, over a hundred permits uh, to do the rebuilding and and uh, for food security 
you need clean you, you need clean floors and for safety regulations you need floors where, where you could not slip so i mean it, it's 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 crazy mm -hmm. and the museum is a very complex building type at, at, at one time it is it is uh, it is fort knox like that but it should also be open to everybody mm -hmm. This is a complete paradox. Mm -hmm. So you have to be welcoming and hey, like that. But safeguard what and you have. At the same time, you're safeguarding because you, you, you're the house of the national collection mm -hmm. and so on and so on. So you have a complete paradox of, of, of measurements that, that, you, that you have to deal with. And that, that's, yeah. Is this a good time to throw open? Uh, you're talking about the sort of um, uh, the dichotomy between the kind of protective museum and opening out to actually throw the discussion open to the floor, because I know that here among this extraordinary group portrait, this night watch that is laid out <laughs> before you, there are lots of people who will have some interesting questions and things to say about the, your respective institutions, the Rijksmuseum and the National Portrait Gallery. And um, I look forward to a lively discussion. So Michelle is going to be um, zooming around and J Julia as well, I beg your pardon, Julia. Uh, see who, which one's quicker. And can you say who you are as well? Then we can really work out um, where you're from. <laughs> yes, where please. <laughs> and where you live. <laughs> we can come and get to you later. <laughs> um, hello, uh, I'm Emma. I'm a student here at Cambridge um, at Churchill. And um, this is really a question for Nicholas about... Um, the new exhibition, Russia and the Arts. Do you, when you're planning an exhibition like that, do you consider it a wider political or diplomatic statement or do you view it more as a self-contained art historical venture? Thanks, that's a good question. I think it has to be both. I just want to check, she's probably not here, but the curator of the exhibition, Polly, Right, th I, no. <laughs> I had a sense that she said that she would probably struggle to get here, so before I started speaking, I just wanted to make sure. Not that I'm going to say anything bad about her, quite the reverse, but just I would actually want her to talk, to talk to this, because that exhibition was, I think, four or five years in the making, so it predates me by some way. Um, one thing I'll say is that when I, when I started in post a year ago, having worked a lot with Russia on the Malevich exhibition, which I just mentioned, and some other initiatives, I founded this Russian Eastern European um, committee at Tate to acquire works of art from that region, which goes back to what I was saying before about Tate's international remit. I was very happy that there was a project that would take me back to Russia and that would also build links, which I think are very important. So first and foremost, you would never do an exhibition as, um, to use a, a, what I think is a really vulgar phrase, soft power. Um, you would do an exhibition because you think it's worthy and interesting and the art is good or it'll get a new audience for many, many reasons, but because you really believe in it and you believe in the objects and the exhibition itself. I think one thing which would be a happy um, accident or would widen that is that it can make an impact or it could even build bridges. And so, for example, in this case, we borrowed 26 portraits from the Trechikov Gallery in Moscow, which are on our walls now, and in return we lent... 49 portraits back to them, and I was just there two weeks ago. So they owe us 23 portraits, which I remind the director. But it was a real exchange, and it was a real act of cultural exchange and, and diplomacy. And I think at this point where there's quite difficult relationships between Russia and other parts of the world, and as someone who spent a huge amount of time in Russia, not that there aren't real issues, but most people that you meet in Russia are actually very interesting nice, cultured people, and I think to maintain that dialogue is very important, and so it's very easy to demonize or write off a country, and I think that's where culture can come in to build those bridges. Does that answer the question? Okay. Thank you. Another. Uh, hi, I'm Rebecca. Uh, I'm an exchange student here at Pembroke studying politics, actually, uh, but I go to school in Washington, D.C., so I frequent the other National Portrait Gallery. Um, <laughs> I was curious how you navigate the, the classist nature of portraiture, um, especially if you seek to, as you say, use the museum to explore changing social and political dynamics, and if the criteria of a portrait is having an identifiable sitter that limits the 
uh, socioeconomic diversity of the pool. Uh, so how do you reconcile that with your mission for the museum, which is a national museum which exists for and is representative of the whole country? Exactly, that's a good question, and that's something I wanted to, to get onto. So um, most of our portraits do have a named sitter. Some don't because they've been reattributed and they tend to go into storage or my office, if I'm completely honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but generally, the reason that we hang a portrait on our walls is because we know who the sitter is. Because, the, as I said before, for, the, for my gallery, it's always sitter first, artist second, which is quite unusual, but interesting. Um, that's something that I think we'll want to discuss, and it's something that in my interview I, I raised as one issue, that I think it does preclude a more democratic approach sometimes. And so one example is um, David Bailey's photographs we did an exhibition with him two years ago, and of course there's the photographs of, I don't know, Jean Shrimpton or more recently Kate Moss, which are very well known. But to me, some of the best photographs are his ones of the East End of London in the early 60s, mm -hmm. where you don't know the name of that person, but it captures, it's a portrait of a, a particular area of London of a whole era. I would argue that actually those are portraits and deserve a place on our walls, and that's a discussion that we'll be having. Equally, this is the example I gave in my interview, <laughs> People like Nan Golden, the American photographer, her photographs from the 80s, again, many of those sitters aren't named. I mean, she probably knew them, but they're, they're not given a name. But they're portraits of a particular era of downtown New York, of the AIDS crisis. So not always every portrait has to have a named individual to be a portrait and to speak of a particular time or place. I think that's a really interesting question. I'm glad you asked it. Hello there. I'm Philip Stevenson, um, later of the Faculty of Education um, here in Cambridge. Um, this is to both of you, uh, because both of you commented on increasing numbers, mm. ever increasing numbers over the last, what, 10, 15 years. Mm. How much do you think the role of the professionalisation and the um, prioritisation of education programmes in museums and galleries, <coughs> and are more aware of what goes on in the MPG and here mm -hmm. than uh, the Reichs and, and, and in the Netherlands, but I know I've seen it in action, so it does happen, <laughs> writ large. Mm. Um, to what extent has that, and particularly, I'm talking not just about schools, formal schools programmes, but wider outreach mm -hmm. to the, the whole community, and actually coming to the point you're talking about democratisation, how much has that had an impact, do you think, on this proliferation in visitor numbers over the last 15 years, let's say? Yeah, good question, and it's very hard to, to give a very clear answer on that, but I think indeed that uh, we live in times that there's much more education in schools and uh, talking about the Netherlands, there, the, the, the art and history is part of the curriculum in, in, in school classes and school classes, they come and go to the Rijksmuseum. We had last year about 350,000 school kids from the Netherlands. Uh, we have uh, private funds who support classes to come with school buses because that's normally the most expensive element of, of, uh, of school visits to museums. I mean, we're free up till 18 year. Um, so having, having financial support for the school buses is, is a very uh, important element. And yes, education is, I think, important and part of the, of the whole success and, and mm -hmm an increase of, of visitors' numbers, yeah. And then, just to follow on, I, I would say in the UK that um, museums continue to thrive almost in spite of a real lack of um, teaching about history in schools because it's actually taught in very few schools, which is um, much to my distress. I, for example, found the art world completely by mistake. No one said to me when I was a teenager, you can do art history, or I stumbled into it. It was just purely by chance. And I think um, it's remarkable to me that there is such an appetite across the UK and across different socioeconomic groups for going to museums and looking at exhibitions when really it's taught in so few schools, and I think that has to change. Hi, um, thank you for the, uh, for the education, and um, I'm coming from the MBA side, so the topic dear to my heart would probably be the art box office. Um, moving forward, as many nations are becoming more globalized, more Facebook-y, more selfie -y. My question would be, um, as behaviors change and people are demanding new things, in your opinion, 
what uh, what would be the change in behaviors of people coming to visit museums, and what should the museum do to adapt to those changes to come? Your question is about about global changes. Is that um, my question? Is uh, if how would the behavior of those coming to museums change, and how do we keep uh, how do museums keep uh, adapting in order to uh, cater to the future? So are they as um, d do visitors behave in the same way as they did before you kind of closed? Yeah. No. And um, <laughs> how do you keep track? Am I saying yeah. the right thing? Yeah. Yeah. How do you keep yeah. keep yeah. Them, them kind of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are yeah. they yeah. terribly behaved? And <laughs> uh, then how do you kind of cope with it? We should find. And how will you cope with it to start with? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't play soccer in a football place. But um, no, I, th there are many ways to to behave in a museum, and there are also many ways to misbehave in a museum. So. Um, yeah, that's, I, I think don't touch the objects, that's for sure. Uh, get dressed in a museum. I mean, there is a lot of things that are already allowed. I mean, it's, it's an extension of the, way of, of the world we live in. I mean, but, and you, you're not making too, too loud noises, but you may speak and you may laugh and you may, you may walk hand in hand and you may, uh, you may have a good time in a museum, nothing against that. But you may not eat, and you may not drink, and you may not do that and that. Or lay, or lay on the floor? No, preferably not. But yeah. So um, there's not a very strict uh, order between good and bad. I mean, I love that people come to a museum and have a good time. So that's 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 in general my feeling. But there are house regulations. So. And, uh, and they, ha they have to be because you're not alone, there are more people. It's yeah. not your private collection, it's everybody's private collection coming at the same time, at the same place. So, indeed, and then maybe coming to your point, uh, that's, there are many people nowadays, I mean, having these iPads, and, and I'm happy that the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre, and it's done masterwork, and it's small like this, and our night watch is a bit larger, so you can still stand in front of our masterwork with let's say 100 people and enjoy the painting. However, if 50 people do, it, do like this with an iPad, then it's, and you may make photographs in the Rijksmuseum, we allow that, no flash, but still. Mm -hmm. um, and what we also do is, and there was this discussion the other day, I think with the V&A, that it was forbidden to make drawings in the galleries. We stimulate to, make, to let people make drawings because we love, again, that people come to a museum and they have a good time, enjoy it, mm -hmm. uh, make drawings, make photographs. It is, it is a kind of, of ownership. If, if people like it and they want to relate to something, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they may not take it from the wall, of course, but, but they, they, if they are very yeah, much in love with the, with the work of art and stand in front of it for an hour or two hours, I'm fine. So, mm -hmm. But indeed, it's changing as society is changing. And we not only get the elite, well-educated people, we get everybody from all ages, from all countries. And yeah, you have to be, yeah, you have to behave like you behave in, a, in an airplane or in a restaurant or whatever. Right, oh, gosh, there's thousands of arms <laughs> up. <laughs> and there is a very important question next. Whoa. One moment and then. <laughs> resolve the problem of success of a museum, which is judged by every director by the increase in the number of visitors, with the crowds that spoil the pleasure of those visitors. And you see, um, I'm very interested that you said that, you, that the Rijksmuseum encourages drawing, and that the v and doesn't, I think it's very sad. The Prado forbids people to take photographs. I think they allow drawing, but it seems to me that the photograph is such a superficial thing, you see. And, but I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about how do you solve this problem? You, you've described how your number of visitors goes soaring up all the time, 
But do you think those visitors have the same experience that they would have had before there were so many? Yeah, that's a good, good question. So actually, are there two questions? Or uh, you note something and you question something. I mean, is one experience better than the other? I mean, it's not to me to judge somebody's experience. If somebody comes in, see the night watch, make a photograph and goes back, who am I to, to judge that he or she has a wrong experience? Maybe it's the highlight of his or her holiday. So I'm fine with that. Though at the same time, I feel that he or she is something missing because there's just much more than being seen there, made a photograph, whatever. Okay, but that's one point. The other point is indeed that not only the Rijksmuseum, many museums, and it's, it's on the agenda for, I mean, I mean this director's group uh, from the, the British and the national, the Bizo group, and one of the themes that we all have to deal with now and more and more is the increase, and there's no way of stopping it, because if the Chinese will come, because it hasn't started yet, and if people from Korea and Brazil and all over the place coming to Europe, because here are the museums, if they all get in a plane and come to the big cities, yeah, then there, there is a, a, a limit number of square meters and, and limits numbers of, of hours, opening hours. The Jeroen Bos exhibition just finished this weekend and they were the last days they were open they have been open 36 hours permanently, so day and night. Mm -hmm. That has also been done in the Royal Academy uh, for the last Monet exhibition. So you can open up in the evening hours. The best visited museum square meters in the world are the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. It's very small. It's, it's, it's a hidden place during the war. And they have over a million visitors every year. And it's open till 10 o'clock and sometimes till 12 o'clock in the night. And it's really what you call a blockbuster. It's going around double. Yeah, there is, at a certain point, there is an end. Standing in front of the Mona Lisa in the Louvre. Yeah, it's, it's what it's about. But I don't know how to, how to organize that. If, if somebody has a good answer, then I'm happy to. To I'm not going to let you ask, answer for this one because I'm going to try and get a, f a yeah, bit more yeah, yeah, audience presentation, yeah. and then Nick then can then answer. There, there's so no good yeah. answer yet. So. Yeah, but thank you very much. Hey, good evening. I'm a postgrad student at Sotheby's Institute of Art in London, and actually lived in Amsterdam during the reopening of Stedelijk and Rijks. So um, was I, I can um, um, assure everybody it was great for the city and, and really created a cultural hub. I'm interested in what you said about um, private collection for everybody and going back to this kind of notion of national art in the light of the national um, funding strategies. So the, all these museums, these, the museums you were talking about, but generally national museums were set up um, by the nation, funded by the nation, um, except in America, but in Europe we see this trend a lot. Um, and as the years progress, there's less and less public money available. I'm interested in if you see there's a change to the mission then, if, if there's less money from the public, is then also less emission to the public and mm. how this affects the museum landscape. Good question. Do you want uh, to shall I start? Yeah. Um, it, it's called the Rijksmuseum, you're right. However, the collections, uh, most of the collections, our collections are donated, uh, bequested by, by, by burgers, by civilians. So in that sense, we sometimes make the joke, uh, burger museum, would be a better name than Rijksmuseum. Anyway, um, there is a decrease, a smaller amount of money coming from the state, and there is a growing part of our budget is coming from private funds, so it's changing. We go more to the Anglo-Saxon or even the American model, where more and more private money is, uh, is coming into the, and not only to culture, but to, to much more non-profit mm -hmm. institutions. We have, uh, the time we live in, and not only in the Netherlands, also in Britain, uh, there are many, many rich people, and uh, this this post-war generation, this baby boom generation, they now reach their 70s, 80s. So, and there's a lot of money amassed in these in this generation. So, it is coming to the non-profit world, and it's stimulated by. Well, it, it's it's a normal story. It, 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 you can you, you you just can can figure it out that it works like that. And it, it is stimulated by tax 
uh, by tax policy, at least in the Netherlands, but also in Britain. So I'm, I, I, I really ve I'm, I'm very optimistic in, in this whole mix model of private and, and state money, but in fact it's nothing new. I'm reading now the book on, on the Jubilee of the Museum and, and uh, Sidney Cockerell was very successful as a fundraiser, uh, raising private money and private donations. So I think for a museum director, but also for curators, it's more and more um, daily uh, uh, activity, not only to focus on the art, but also to, to be active as a fundraiser. And the golden rule in this is you have to make friends before you need them. And that's, 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 the, whole, <laughs> that's the whole idea of, of uh, just, yeah. raising more and more private money. And just to add to that, because um, obviously having just come from the American model at the Met, but previously having worked at MoMA and the Guggenheim and having always gone between American and European museums, one of the reasons I wanted to come back, the Met is an extraordinary museum. But one thing I realized in my time there was that I completely drifted without meaning to from any sense of an engagement with the audience. Because, I mean, I'm putting it in very stark terms, but you know, I made exhibitions and I made acquisitions, but the, how I got to do those was by calling up the trustees, who essentially are, of course, in the American model, the paymasters of the museum and the curator. And so what, you have to spend so much time cultivating a very select few that eventually, you actually begin to lose touch with why you're doing things in the first place. And one of the reasons I wanted to come back to the UK, even though my life will be much, much harder, is that there is that real sense of the public and the public good and it being transparent and for the public. And that actually is why I got into this in the first place, that I wanted to kind of make contact with that again. So there's pros and cons to both models. That said, I'm very, as you were saying, I'm very supportive of European museums becoming, um, learning certain things from the American model, even though the systems are very different so you can't ever completely um, translate it, but we can become more entrepreneurial with a mix of still public focus. So that, I think, is one thing that we can do. Michelle, you have to be the arbiter. I know there's one, okay, two more, one and one. I think that's it. So yep. my name is Tobias. I'm a postgraduate student and I'm at Magdalen College. And my question relates to um, the notion that you are like national museums. Um, my generation, or like many of my friends, consider themselves, I don't know, they are born in Spain, and Netherlands, Germany, Poland, but feel more like cosmopolitan or at least European. And then there's this other notion of like nationalism arising at like Front National, um, uh, AfD in Germany, or like the UKP movement here in the UK. And you as a national museum, how do you cope with this like tensions on of the one hand, like we are becoming more... Um, European as like uh, identity or like more cosmopolitan in some ways and on the other hand uh, more national and more nationalistic uh, in other parts of the of, of the population of each respective country well okay well. hopefully we're not nationalistic I want to get rid of that word right away because you can be national without being nationalistic they're two different things I hope um, obviously, you know, a national museum is a particular thing, and especially a museum which is focused on national history, which is what we are. That said, as I was saying before, in terms of our visitors, they're local, they're national, and they're international. And so you want to reach a range of different audiences. And I don't think the story that we tell, which is British, is not relevant to visitors that come from anywhere else in the world. And, you know, on our walls we have Shakespeare, although he's in Moscow right now, I'm afraid, actually. But um, usually we have Shakespeare. Oh, time done. Sorry, I can't answer the rest of the question. <laughs> no, but, you know, I think that the story is relevant to an international audience, and it's also, to be slightly more thorny, it's relevant to countries that have a history with Britain because of colonialism. And so that's interesting in itself, if you make that transparent and obvious. So there's different ways that you can make a national story relevant internationally, I hope. But I think that is an interesting challenge. I don't know if you want to speak to that. No, I agree with that. And at the same time, I mean, being, I mean, we don't celebrate nationalism, as, as Nick said, but, but, and at the same time, many movements and many, uh, many historical facts have been not specifically Dutch or British or German or whatever. I mean, romanticism or, or, 
or um, naturalism or the, yeah or the, the reformation or there are many many things that 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 occurred and that that took place in many countries at the same time though here you have it a bit in a british with a british flavor as in holland you have it with a dutch flavor and there are differences and there are uh, the things that that are taking place at the same time uh, at, at different places so you have this this variety of of big movements in time and and i think that's that's good to see the differences and at the same time you see well hey we're 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 all human after all so well, ju just to sort of round that out one of the the many clever and wonderful things that neil mcgregor did as, as director of the british museum was to turn that rather fraught history of spoliation again of empire into something that was inclusive and international and so using this phrase a museum of the world for the world that's one way to turn a potential negative into a positive I'll be trying to see myself. Um, one final question from the most patient person in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Uh. Hi, Hi um, I'm Patricia. I'm here as an archaeologist at the university. I've just come back from Den Bosch, where this magnificent exhibition has attracted so many people. However, I did notice that um, there were kind of there must have been some hiccups along the line. The Prado would not lend the Garden of Earthly Delights, fine, but also some something must have happened at the last minute because already in the catalogue, the cure for folly, one version of the cure for folly was actually described and it wasn't the one on um, on display. So uh, pulling something quite at the end must be a nightmare. Um, could you comment on this? And it goes it back a very to the specific uh, thing. I'm not aware of, of all the details of the Den Bosch exhibition. Uh, however, we from the Rijksmuseum, we shared many experiences and we were also, um, uh, and we offered uh, other museums in Europe and outside Europe uh, loans uh, to help this provincial museum in Den Bosch, which is a small museum, uh, smaller than the Fitzwilliam, and, and, and really having no I mean, the great, the great hero of Den Bos is obviously Jeroen Bos, and they don't have Jeroen Bos, but they wanted to make a Jeroen Bos exhibition, which is a, an, an, a, a dream. And it's the way they did it, they had about 20 or something. I don't know. I don't. I think they had uh, at least 22, uh, 22. But they had an enormous number of his drawings, which was superb. Yeah, which, which is superb. But, and, and at the same time, of course, they do not have the Garden of Delight. Uh, and some other w works from, uh, I think, Vienna and, and maybe Portugal or whatever. It's because these works are very precious and in, in, the, in the Garden of Delight from the Prado, it is their night watch, it is a national treasure and it, and it can't ever travel. I think not even without, uh, outside the doors of the Prado itself. So, um, but um, I think you have to go again to Den Bosch because now the, this exhibition is going to the Prado. You can see it over there with, with, the, uh, with the Garden of Delight as, as a centerpiece. Um, but making exhibitions is, 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 of course, a very interesting part of, of our museum world and, and, and making them national or not or international or whatever. It's, it's, it's part of our museum business and it's uh, fun to do and it makes you travel to the Netherlands. You have never been to Den Bosch before, I mean. I think I'll definitely be going again because it was a, a wonderful, a wonderful place to visit. The people yeah. were so very friendly. The food was absolutely phenomenal. How good! <laughs> and, and just this, this was the commercial break. Then. <laughs> <laughs> and just down the road, there's another. There's the art gallery that has all these reproductions, which are extremely good. I haven't been there. Sorry. <laughs> you <laughs> missed it. Because <laughs> you very much cut your teeth with. with Exhibitions, um, you know, making, yeah, it's making, them. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you've had your fair share of withdrawals at last minute and that's attribution problems and things. What are you saying? I don't think I have. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the, that was the problem at Den Bosch, the Prado. Yeah, yeah, was yeah very, no, I know, I know, I know. He was incredibly pissed off that some of their works were deemed not to be by Bosch, yeah. and so they swiped yeah. them back. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, um, I don't want to go into specifics because it's tedious, but I, I would say that I think exhibition making is becoming increasingly complicated logistically and financially as um, values go up and as this loan fatigue sets in with museums and private collectors around the world it's I mean not that there's no reason for the public to know or care about this because it's not the point but it is deeply political and we all swap and trade favors and um, 
So it's fascinating and interesting, but not easy. But hopefully that doesn't come across to the audience that sees it, because that's not the point. They're there to see the artist and the work. Yes, yep. please. Um, sorry, I, I, um, I'm here representing our donor, actually, this evening, um, who is very interested in um, the work around attributions. And given that we have three of you that must have to deal with the thorny issue of attributions. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that, not least because you also, if you're going to work, move into the realm of selfies, I don't know where you begin with that. Well, oddly enough, Wim and I have just been talking about the attribution of the, the, the Rembrandt portrait in the Dutch gallery, which of course, many years ago, was demoted by the Rembrandt project. Um, it was one of the great pictures of Lord Fitzwilliam. And we were standing in front of it saying, whatever it is, it's a fantastic picture. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, Nick, you also have... Um, well, we have that all the time, but again, not just with the attribution of the artist, but also the attribution of the sitter, which can change. And that's why some things, as I said before, end up, even we have fantastic paintings that are not shown because the sitter is now um, unknown or we've changed the attribution. So it's a, it's a very thorny issue. I think the really important thing to bear in mind is that whatever conclusion you come to, with an esteemed group of scholars and experts, 50 years later that can be rethought and revised and you can be proved wrong. So th there should always be a sense of humility, I think, when you make an attribution that that is always temporary at best and never the final word. Yeah, uh, I mean, we stood in front of the Rembrandt and I was here on Sunday and I said, well, it's, uh, first, it's, it's a damn good painting. Mm. Very, very, very good painting. So my question, uh, standing in front of it would be, why not? And then you, you try to, to, to take down all the arguments, uh, why not? And I, I think that the arguments that have been used by the Rembrandt Research Project uh, in the 60s or 70s or whenever it was, um, yeah, maybe they could reinvestigate uh, because the technique is going on. I mean, in Cambridge, like in many university cities, you have more and more techniques coming up. You have ultraviolet, you, have, you can look behind the paint, you can really, really find many, uh, uh, not, not only seeing the eyes, but really going deep into the material. And, and, but even though, if you say, okay, this material has only been used by Rembrandt or has never been used by Rembrandt, then still it can be a Rembrandt because Rembrandt was also experimenting with, with technique, et cetera. Um, and at a, at, a certain, and at a certain point, you have to say, is it yes or no a Rembrandt, or is it work in the studio of Rembrandt? Because we think that an artist as a single genius guy or girl made a complete painting, which in 17th century Holland uh, it was not the case. I mean, he had a studio and he was making a living as a professional. Uh, so maybe the face and the hands are by Rembrandt and the rest is just by, by, a, by a student or whatever. So, but still, key is, is it a good painting? And, and uh, yeah, it's a beautiful painting. And uh, let me put it, uh, not to give a compliment like that, but I would accept it as a Rembrandt. <laughs> okay, you're done. You it's a done answer. deal. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, um, can I first of all thank our wonderful speakers, Wim and Nicholas, for um, in front of us all talking so intelligently and um, illuminatingly about the business of being a museum director of two very different but equally enterprising institutions. And um, I'd like to thank you all for um, all your questions and all your patience and your interest. I think it's been a really good evening. So thanks very much to the Humanitas programme for supporting us.